Cheating and sports combine like beans on toast, really. If you go onto Google and type in sports and cheating, you're gonna get so many results that you're gonna be there for, well, quite literally, hours. Everything from state-sponsored doping to Justin Gatlin to financial fair play breaches and the creme de la creme of sports cheating, Lance Armstrong. Or just cycling in general, really, given that there were so many dopers at that time, if they ever did go through and attribute it to the one that wasn't doping, they'd have to give it to the guy who rides the motorbike with the caramel on the back, because he'll be the only person they'll take a urine sample from and it won't dissolve the flask. And it's happened in motorsport too, many of which I've covered here. Option 13, Spygate, Crashgate, and the time Tyrrell put lead shot into the engine to bump the weight up at the pit stops, so everything was legal come the end of the race. Yeah, okay, that one's a bit more difficult, because Tyrrell was in a spot of bother. They were the only non-turbo car on the grid, and there might have been other factors at play here. They were done for illegal fuel additives and illegal ballast, but yeah, it's complicated. But while Tyrrell was kicked out of the championship completely and had all of their points wiped off and the two podiums that they'd scored that season wiped off completely, 20 years after that, and well, 20 years ago, pretty much, there was another case of a team supposedly cheating and people wanted them kicked out of the championship. And that was BAR in the 2005 Formula 1 season. 2005 was just a weird year in general. And really the weirdest thing about it was the whole new tyre rule that basically said, you put a set of tyres on for your qualifying runs, and that's the same set you've got to use for the entire race. No changes, unless you get a puncture, and even then you can only change the iffy one. If you weren't there for it, it was the most pointless rule set in history, as cars would come into the pits and they'd only be sticking fuel in. It was all very underwhelming. It was part of the so-called Ferrari killer rule set for that particular year. People were sick of the Schumacher dominance, so the FIA changed it up a bit. So with this whole one tyre set ruling for the Grand Prix thing, well, Michelin was able to build tyres that were good enough to last for the entire Grand Prix, probably drawing on their endurance racing experience, but Bridgestone was suffering. Renault was dominating the season, having won all the opening rounds of the season at Australia, Malaysia, Bahrain and San Marino. Michelin tyres would win all but one race that season, and that's only because they weren't in that race. That race being the US Grand Prix where they had to pull out due to safety concerns. But if they hadn't, you'd think they probably would have won all the races, and Schumacher would have gone the whole season without a single victory. At the San Marino Grand Prix, McLaren's MP420 had started to find some pace, and had been on pole position for the Grand Prix, with Alonso half a second behind and BAR's Jensen Button in third. Such was the difference in pace between Michelin and Bridgestone that year, you had to go down to 10th to find one of the Bridgestone runners. And that runner was Barrichello, well ahead of his teammate who was stuck in 14th. The Ferrari of Schumacher 4.3 seconds slower than Raikkonen. I think they filled Schumacher up to go longer in the race though because things went better on the Sunday for him. But the fragile MP420 did what it did best and broke down, Raikkonen's drive shaft failing on lap 9 with Alonso taking the lead thereafter. Schumacher struggled to pass Trulli during the race, being behind the Toyota for about 20 laps, and then he managed to get clean air and pumped in the laps. When Schumacher pitted, he was out in front of Trulli and then managed to overhaul the gap to Jensen in front, wiping out a 20 second gap in 13 laps. Michael then caught up to Alonso and the two went at it for the rest of the Grand Prix, with Alonso defending like hell for 12 laps before the end of the Grand Prix. Alonso took the victory just two tenths of a second ahead of the Michael. Button was third, finishing where he started, with Wurtz fourth, Sato fifth, Villeneuve sixth, and then Trulli, Heidfeld, Weber, and Liuzzi filling the rest of the top ten. For BAR, it was a very good finish. The previous year, at Imola, Jensen had scored his first ever career pole, in a season where Schumacher and Ferrari had been the dominant force. And it was BAR's first points of the season, given how in Australia they'd been 11th and 14th, and then two double retirements in a row at Malaysia and Bahrain. With Button and the car now competitive, it seemed like BAR's fortune were on the up, and the changes made to the car just before the European season were working. Basically, BAR hadn't really got to grips with the new 2005 rule set, either because they'd left development on the 2005 car too late because they were fighting for second in the Constructors' Championship, and, well, they got it because they peaked in 2004, or they just simply got it wrong. Or maybe a bit of both. I don't know, but that was basically what happened. They hadn't adapted to the 2005 rules properly. 
So just as a recap, the FIA told the teams they had to raise their front wings and move the rear wings closer, which was designed to reduce the downforce available as the 2004 cars had become the fastest ever created up to that point. It made for some interesting design choices though, as the vast majority of the teams exploited this loophole that allowed the central part of the wing to be lower to the ground than the end plates, which helped claw back some of the downforce. I don't know the specifics of how, but I think it has something to do with sending the air to the undertray and the diffuser. But after the race in part Ferme, the FIA was doing all of its checks on the top three cars. When they got to Button's car, they drained the BAR of fuel and they found that the zero fuel weight of the car was less than the 600 kilos permitted as a minimum weight. Through sheer chance, the stewards had found that the BAR had two fuel tanks, the second of which was capable of holding a decent amount of extra fuel, around 11 kilos or something, which is about 24, 25 pounds, which meant that it was capable of being run under the weight limit. The reason for this tank, BAR claimed, was that the car needed at least six kilos of fuel in the tank for the engine to work, because that's the way Honda had built it. So basically, that fuel tank was there just to run the engine, and nothing else, and that the FIA had no proof that they were using it to be able to run while under the weight limit. So the stewards ummed and erred for a little bit and basically said, yeah, we can't prove that you've used this fuel tank illegally. You're free to go. They let Button keep his third place, they let Sato keep his fifth place, and everything went as normal. But then the FIA got involved. The FIA wouldn't accept BAR's explanation and said that the stewards had made a boo-boo with regards to their decision making. And then the FIA hauled BAR in front of the International Court of Appeal, making it a rare occasion where the FIA had appealed a decision and not the teams. The FIA wanted to hear this explanation again, making their own reasoning of the fact that while the tank might have been there, in BAR's own words, to make sure the engine worked properly and needed that much fuel in there to make sure it would run, the FIA was of the impression that BAR could start the engine up and run the car for a qualifying lap while underweight. Back then, F1 cars were much, much lighter than they are now, with cars having a minimum weight of 605 kilos in qualifying and 600 kilos in the race. And since cars had to qualify with race fuel in those days, it meant BAR could fill up with less fuel and then run in the second qualifying session, but then somehow go as far as the other cars that had the same amount in, if that makes any sense. Another part of this was that BAR had essentially told the FIA, yeah, Charlie, the car's empty, knock yourself out, do all the checks you got to do, with them still having fuel in another tank in the car to make sure it was above the legal weight. So I'm going to try and put this a little bit more simply for you as to what the FIA might have been thinking. Let's say the car is, with both tanks empty, 595 kilos. Sorry America, I'm using kilos here and not pounds so you might have to do your own maths or just use kilos like the rest of us. When the 11 kilograms of we need this in the car to turn the engine over fuel is put in, that bumps the weight up to 606 kilos, so it's one kilo above the minimum weight for the race. The FIA's argument was BAR could then put, for the sake of argument, 50 kilos of fuel in and have 61 kilos of fuel on board. Let's say Renault had put 50 kilos of fuel in their car and that could run for, sake of argument, 17 laps on that tank. The FIA was thinking that BAR would then be able to go a couple of laps longer because they dipped into that second fuel tank and then would then be driving around underweight. And all the other teams would be going, crikey, that Honda is absolutely sipping fuel. That's the technical explanation for it. The TLDR explanation is illegal ballast, along with the whole, you lied to Charlie about draining the car of fuel thing. So flashbacks to 1984, when Tyrrell was basically doing the same thing. They were topping the tanks up with about seven or eight liters of water mixed with 63 kilos or so of lead shot, designed to bring the car up to the minimum weight come the end of the race. The issue that Tyrrell had is that some of that shot came flying out of the car when Brundle and Beloff drove away, which is why I refer to the cars as the world's fastest shotguns. So Tyrrell was hit with charges of illegal ballast, as the whole using fluids loophole had been closed after the water cooled brakes thing used by Williams and Brabham, as well as having 27.5% aromatics in that water, which the FIA said was an illegal second fuel source. And the big irony of all of this is that up until the end of the 1998 season, BAR had been Tyrrell, which is crazy to think. And like I said, Tyrrell was the only non-turbo team in 1984, so there is all this stuff about how the FIA was looking for any reason, any excuse, to get rid of Tyrrell, because whenever they had a vote to sort of benefit the, the turbo teams, Ken would say, well, I don't want that because I've not got a turbo engine. So the faster they could get rid of Tyrrell, the better rules they can bring into the benefit of the rest of the grid. 
But it all just undid the heroics of Brundle and Beloff that year, especially Beloff at Monaco. That drive was just brilliant. When BAR was finally disqualified, Honda's spokesman Tatsuya Ida said, We feel the ruling is too severe. We gave them proof we didn't break the rules and to be accused of cheating is hurtful. We have also kept to the rules and the regulations are very ambiguous. There should be a clear definition. We don't understand the punishment. The FIA knew we have a new device in the gasoline tank. Without it, the car won't move. We feel we didn't break any rules and the stewards agreed, so it's very sad. The FIA said, The presentation of the team of fuel consumption data cannot guarantee that the vehicle complied at all times with the minimum weight requirements. It is not possible for the court to find on the basis of the evidence that it was provided with that Lucky Strike BAR Honda deliberately committed fraud. But the court decided that BAR's decision not to ask for clarifications but the court decided that BAR's decision not to ask for a clarification as to whether their system was legal amounted to a highly regrettable negligence and lack of transparency. The FIA initially wanted to kick BAR out for the rest of the season like they had done with Tyrrell 20 years prior, but the problem was, like they said in that statement, they couldn't find out whether BAR was trying to deliberately mislead people and deliberately cheat. So what they did was is they banned them for the next two races as well as upholding the disqualification from San Marino. And when they came back, they were allowed to race, but they had a six month ban suspended for a year. What that means is, so long as they don't commit any more offences in regards to cheating for the rest of the season, they'd be fine. But as soon as they did commit an offence, banned for six months. Within a year, if that makes any sense. It did set the team back a bit. When they came back at the 2005 European Grand Prix, they were still without points and wouldn't get anything on the board until the French Grand Prix of that year which was the race after the mess of that year's United States Grand Prix. But from Manicor all the way to the finale in China, Button rescued BAR's season by getting points at every remaining race, and also got two podiums, one at Hockenheim and one at Spa. Sato would only get a single point at Hungary, and as a result, Sato would be dropped for the 2006 season. He'd be replaced by Rubens Barrichello. Don't need to look too much into the disqualification at Japan, Sato fired Trolley off and was disqualified for it. So when it's all said and done, this is the last time a team has had to sit out because of a ban, and it had been the first time a team had been under this kind of scrutiny since Tyrrell was expelled from the 1984 season. Yes, Schumacher was kicked out of the 1997 standings but was still allowed to race through 1998, and McLaren was booted from the 2007 season but no race bans were ever brought into effect, they were just deleted from the Constructors' Championship. Drivers have picked up bans before, such as Mansell, Schumacher, Hackman, Irvine and so on, and drivers getting one since, such as Grosjean for the opening lap of the 2012 Belgian Grand Prix. But in terms of a team getting a ban, that's unheard of, at least since 2005. In fact, I'm struggling to find the time another team was in this kind of hot water. I think Andrea Moda might be the only other team that's been told, don't bother showing up to the next race because you won't be allowed on the grid. Let me just check that for a second. No, it's not probably, it is. And it didn't do much for the wider F1 world, to be honest. When BAR came back for the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, they just carried on as if they'd never been away. You'd think had they been in for a shot at the title as Benetton had been 10 years before, it probably would have been a massive thing. But it was very quiet, and something you don't hear much about even today. They got caught, they did the time, they came back. That's literally it. But I guess when you have the emergence of Alonso, the poor season that Schumacher and Ferrari suffered, and the absolute carnage that was the United States Grand Prix that took up all the headlines in the sports media, I mean, all of them, it was such a huge thing, you can probably see why. So then a look at the BAR disqualification from the 2005 San Marino Grand Prix, and the two race ban that came as a result. If this has taught you something new, or reminded you of something that happened back then that you didn't really know a lot about, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more stuff like this, subscribe and get the Stefan Bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks to the kind supporters at Patreon and the channel members, and if you want to join in with supporting the channel at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with a link to the F1 store. There's some offers that I'll put in the pinned comment underneath this video. And if you want to join as a member, there's a button underneath the video, as well as a button for super thanks if you just want to do a one and done donation to help keep things running around here. Also in the description is a link to my socials if you just want to connect at that level. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.